When steamships replaced sailing ships, coal became the fuel of choice and ships made of steel replaced ships made of wood, and only coal produced enough power for the new metal ships that burned three or four tons per hour at cruising speed and up to ten tons at maximum speed. Wood did not produce enough heat for even an emergency substitute, and warships carried up to 10,000 tons of coal, so Britain's dependence on the coal miners increased. The coal miners wanted higher wages and better working conditions from their overlords, and some of the more lily-livered trade unions easily buckled under the British threat of force, but coal miners were a breed apart, and the strikes were the worst in 1926, and coal miners were the last to go back to work. The British thought Russian communists were behind the strikes, especially because Russian coal miners had been the backbone of the Russian Revolution in 1917, and without oil-burning furnaces to heat English homes, the Crown was dependent on coal miners to keep that coal coming, and Britain also needed coal to keep up their iron production for building the new ships. Britain maintained coaling stations in all the seven seas for powering the Royal Navy around the world, and they needed the coal miners to supply those coaling stations, and when ships burning oil replaced coal after 1900, the miners were being cut back, fueling the Union strikes. With the growth of technology, machines and factories made the workplace not so much fun anymore because instead of short periods of hard work, the factories needed people all day long, every day, doing the same thing over and over. And before factories, the workplace had been not just for working, but a location where people gathered to socialize. In factories, work was no longer a lifestyle, but had become a mere job, and their only change of routine was going to church or to court. And while there were few enough festivals to give the factory workers a holiday, there was always alcohol. In the cities, there was more free, free time to drink instead of just growing food and raising livestock, and the Corn Laws of 1815 limited the trade of alcohol-producing grains, and in 1830 England passed the Beer Act that was supposed to be about free trade and the Corn Laws, but it hurt the poor because the rich could buy their alcohol ready-made. On English farms, they could just let corn sit for a few weeks to work itself into alcohol, while the poor commoners, commoners living in the city had trouble brewing their own because they lacked the necessary supplies and the space to make and store the brew. The Corn Laws were supposed to keep up the price of English corn and wheat using stiff tariffs on the corn and wheat grown by slaves in the American South, but with the higher price of corn and wheat in England, it became a hardship on the common Englishmen to brew their own alcohol from corn and wheat, so they began using potatoes, and that put a hardship on the Irish. Vodka was made from potatoes, but Russians didn't grow potatoes until the time of Catherine the Great, who was a German, and when she brought potatoes to Russia, they called it devil's weed because it was so hard to get rid of after planting. The English bought potatoes from the Belgians, who'd gotten a load of potatoes from America, contaminated with blight, and those diseased potatoes found their way into Ireland in 1843, or so the story goes in trying to blame America for what was clearly a British problem. And when British commissioners finally made their way northward to find out why the Irish were starving, the Crown thought the Irish were making vodka instead of having suffered potato blight, and the English refused to help feed the starving Irish, which forced them to immigrate to America after the Great Potato Famine of 1845. The Irish had been a thorn in Britain's side and were always at the heart of workers' strikes, and Ireland was half the size of Georgia, and what Irish hadn't migrated to America lustily joined in the year of revolutions in 1848, and the Crown responded to these revolutionaries by repealing the Corn Laws which was an easy call because enough money was coming into the Queen's coffers after the success of the First Opium War, along with the British income tax begun in 1842. To add insult to injury, the English worker found out that the industrial rich cared less for the common people than had the nobility, and in 1901, 
workmen's compensation was born in England, but because so many workmen's comp claims were filed by exhausted, injury-prone miners, work in the coal mines was limited to, in 1908 to eight hours a day. The following year, the unions were forbidden to use union funds for political purposes, and in 1911, the employers had to pay for workmen's comp themselves instead of the crown, so the great railway strike was on and would continue until the Great War broke out and all railroads came directly under control of the military. The Parliament Law of 1911 said that if Parliament passed a law three times, the House of Lords could no longer overrule it, and the Trade Union Act of 1913 allowed unions to spend their money on politics, and the Home Rule Bill finally passed in 1914, giving Ireland a parliament of their own, just in time to be conscripted into the Great War, where 400,000 Irish and British soldiers would die advancing nine, mi nine miles in the First Battle of the Somme. The Great War killed 13 million people, and the British lost more officers than enlisted, because the officers were trained to personally lead the charge into battle, and for the first time during Hitler's war, more civilians would die than soldiers as the result of aerial bombing and improved long-range shelling. The trench warfare of the Great War offered untold despair as armies faced each other across no man's land for years, hoping that starvation and suffering would grind down the other side. And the growth of technology also made the Great War what it was, not just in terms of firepower, but because the advanced ships and railroads spread the flu around in its wake, and so the fighting had stopped not so much from any battlefield maneuvers, but because the flu knocked everyone out of action. German soldiers from the trenches had not been defeated on the battlefield, but were allowed to march home with their weapons because the war had ended diplomatically rather than in any military victory. Soldiers had fallen deeply in love with their fatherland after fighting so hard for Germany in their trenches for four years, and they saw themselves as different from the stupid English and the insane French, and mostly Germans thought of themselves as quite unlike the stubborn Russians who had nonetheless abandoned the battlefield before the war was over. <laughs>